Look upon me, O ye great and mighty gods, who are foremost among the spirits of Anu. Let me be exalted in your presence. Lo, I come that I may purify this soul of mine in the most high degree. Let not the impediment which cometh from your mouth be issued against me. Let me be purified in the lake of Epicuas. Let me plunge into the divine pool beneath the two divine sycamores of heaven and earth." Unquote. Baptism by Anup is never actually depicted or carried out and thus never mentioned. It is simply a product of ad lib or superimposing onto the actual story. Notice all that it says is Horus is asking for edification and forgiveness. This is merely an example of amplification of what the Egyptian glyph chronicles. The source citation is therefore inadequate. The original source that mentions Anup the Baptizer is not Egyptian, it is Gerald Massey. Massey never mentions where this name is mentioned in any Egyptian text. The fact is that Anup the Baptizer does not exist in any Egyptian text whatsoever. The name Anup is a misspelling of the Egyptian Anubis. He never baptized Horus in any Egyptian text. Anubis wasn't even a baptizer, he was an embalmer. He was a great protector of God, guiding the soul through the underworld, and is usually depicted as a jackal-headed or wild dog-headed man, or a reclining black jackal. I don't see any parallel to Matthew which says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was baptized because he had to fulfill the legal requirements for entering into priesthood. The supposed unverified text does not even state Horus was 30 when baptized or even objectively baptized at all for that matter. It's just unreliable and subjective. As Dr. William Lane Craig notes, we find almost no trace of cults of dying and rising gods in first century Palestine, unquote. So if these cults weren't even in first century Palestine, how would the early church construct baptism based on Horus? Until and unless the Zeitgeist people verify the presence in first century Palestine and gain a consensus on the supposed baptism of Horus, I cannot accept this thesis. Massey is unreliable and rejected by modern scholarship. Zeitgeist claims Horus had 12 disciples. Horus had 16 followers, a group of followers called Mensu, and 4 disciples called Hiro Shemzu. Since you cannot find 12 disciples in the Horus myth, Acharya then turns to the zodiac calendar as evidence. This is all based off the assumption that the Egyptians saw 12 signs as Horus' disciples, which there is no evidence of. The sun does pass through the 12 signs, but Jesus does not pass through his 12 disciples in any fashion similar to the zodiac. If the Bible was based off the zodiac, we would expect to see the similar movement through the disciples. AnsweringInfidels.com reports, the 12 apostles were most certainly assigned because of the 12 tribes of Judah. Skeptics might say that the 12 tribes of Judah were based off the zodiac, but the division of the 12 signs of the zodiac didn't occur until the 5th century BC, well after the 12 tribes. It seems then the only evidence that Acharya has is the number 12. As Mike Lacona states, quote, Miss Murdoch also holds that when we see 12 figures in the Bible, that these are representative of the 12 zodiac signs, she writes. In reality, it is no accident that there are 12 patriarchs, 12 tribes of Israel, and 12 disciples, 12 being the number of astrological signs. If we want to accept her thoughts on this, we also need to accept that Dunkin' Donuts is owned by an astrologer, since they give a discount when you buy a dozen donuts. Grocery stores are also run by astrologers, since you buy eggs by the dozen. Even our legal system must be influenced by astrology, since there are 12 jurors. When you want to see astrology in something, you see it even when it requires that you read in foreign meanings into the text. We also have numerous evidence for the original disciples of Jesus, for example, towards the end of the first century, Clement writes, quote, Peter through unrighteous envy endured not one or two, but numerous labors, and when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him, unquote. In regard to miracles, there is some magic associated with Horus, but this is with Horus the child, not Horus the elder or his adult forms. He was known for warding off dangerous creatures such as crocodiles and other beasts. Horus on the crocodile was a common manifestation of the importance of the Horus healing ritual. The healing of Horus from scorpion stings by Isis is noted. The power of healing seems to come from his mother Isis, who is indeed the goddess of immense magical power. He never exercised demons or raised his father from the dead. Not one miracle that Jesus did can be found in the Horus story. Horus never walked on water, he was merely thrown in the water. And because of this fact, defenders of Zeitgeist say that he was in the sky and the sky looks like water. This is just pathetic and not even worth responding to though. 
There is no evidence for the title zeitgeist listed. The forms of Horus are Horus the Child, magical titles such as Horus on the Crocodile, Horus as the son of Isis and Osiris, pillar of his mother, and Horus as the sun god, lord of the sky, god of the east, Horus of the horizon, and later associated with Ra. God's anointed son, the son of man, good shepherd, and lamb of God, word made of flesh, and the word of truth, the way, the truth, and the light, and Messiah, are not recognized as Horus titles by any Egyptologist. Messiah seems suspicious since it is Hebrew in origin, and the title, the way, the truth, and the light, does not even exist in the Bible. John 14 verse 6 says the way, the truth, and the life, not light. Since this title is not attributed to the Horus story, my hypothesis is that Zeitgeist or one of Zeitgeist's sources simply made it up not knowing what John 14 verse 6 really said. Horus wasn't crucified, buried for three days, or resurrected. Horus had one of his eyes ripped out, but he was not killed. It was his father Osiris who was killed, dismembered, reconstructed, and revived by Isis, his magical mother. Horus was never crucified. There's an unofficial story in which he dies and is cast into pieces into the water, and then later fished out by a crocodile at Isis's request. This unofficial story is the only one in which he dies at all. He becomes merged with Ra, which meant rebirth of the sun in the east, and it is based on the cycles of nature, not any sort of historical claims, unlike the story of Jesus, and it does not constitute as a crucifixion and resurrection. And even in this death, there are no references to a tomb anywhere. Ra and Horus never completely merged into a single falcon-headed sun god. It made Ra into Horus, who was the son of Ra. It made Ra his own son and father. Another source notes a story where Horus is bitten by a snake and revived, which still is not much of a parallel at all. It seems like a desperate attempt to make a connection, mere bias pattern searching, with the intent of finding similarity, poor judgment, and unreliable criteria. Zeitgeist explains, quote, The images begin with Thoth announcing to the virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Meth, the Holy Ghost impregnating the virgin, then the virgin birth, and the adoration, unquote. This is what Zeitgeist claims. In regard to the inscription and Zeitgeist's interpretation, I contacted Dr. John Baines, professor of Egyptology at Oxford University. He states, quote, the reliefs you mention show the conception and birth of the future king after the creator god, Amen, Ra, has taken on the form of the existing king to impregnate the queen. There are links, but they are very far apart. Your source is a very long way off that, and several of the statements it makes are wrong." Unquote. Then I contacted Janet Johnson, PhD, professor of Egyptology at the University of Chicago. She remarks, quote, The scene showing the god Amen visiting the queen mother to impregnate her with the future ruler in this case, Queen Hatshepsut. A Christian interpretation just doesn't work." Unquote. I then contacted Victor Blunden of Manchester University and Liverpool University, and of Ancient Egypt magazine. He states, quote, I have heard mention of this film before, and though I haven't seen it myself, I understand that it contains many misinterpretations and distortions of the actual Egyptian textual and relief material to get its message across. Egyptian kings were believed to be semi-divine beings, the son of an Egyptian god, by a human mother. Thus the relief refers to King Amenophis III, and not to Horus. Though kings could sometimes be said to be the incarnation of the gods due to another Egyptian myth, this is where the confusion may have come in. The reliefs actually refer to the conception of the king showing he was born of a human mother, the queen of Egypt, by the god Amun. It was not seen as an immaculate conception, as the queen was impregnated by the god Amun. This is not the virgin Isis but the Queen of Egypt depicted, and by this time she was not a virgin, as she had sex. The second scene clearly shows a pregnant queen, Metumwia, standing between two Egyptian gods. The scene generally show the baby infant being presented to the other Egyptian gods, and finally being presented to the god Amun, who acknowledges that the child is his true son, and thus the future king of Egypt. Thus, the interpretation of this scene by the film Zeitgeist appears totally wrong as it imposes Christian values and interpretations on a typical scene showing the divine conception of an Egyptian king. The god Horus is not mentioned here. Isis is not depicted as far as I can see. There are no three kings or magi bearing gifts, which is total fabrication and quite out of context in this Egyptian myth." Unquote. I then contacted the scholar William Gordon of the UCLA. He remarks, quote, that is a very, very liberal interpretation of the divine birth. This scene assuredly does not comment on the queen's status as a virgin. I think the interpretation of the scene that you describe from the documentary takes the divine birth and runs with it. 
taking it in directions that are not warranted by the evidence." Unquote. I then contacted the Egyptologist 